Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Unlocked, where we talk about unlocking the potential of you, the people you work with, and the people you do life with. At the time of this recording, I'm offering all of you, yes, my lovely listeners, a free 15-minute communication coaching call. You come with some kind of communication problem, and I give you a solution. My calendar link is in the show notes, so check that out. Daphna Horowitz is a person with a bright vocal range, a bright spirit, a bright idea about life. And she's going to share that with us today. And it was really fun interviewing her. Um, I'm really grateful for her, her uh, being patient and staying up a little, little later for us. Um, she's located in Israel, originally from South Africa. And uh, the insights that she shares today are really relevant, I think, for the, those of you in the CEO world, um, or working your way up to that, or I'm just going to say management in general. Uh, but we're going to talk specifically about the CEO, uh, world today. That's, she calls herself the CEO coach. That is actually her title. Um, and the Daphna is a trusted advisor working with clients around the globe, but she's created extraordinary, uh, um, results built leaders in their businesses. Daphna actually comes from a very interesting space. I always like to understand where different coaches come from and inside my circle and different people I meet. She was actually an actuary at a, at a, at a corporation and a large consulting firm. And we get into that a little bit. I asked her specifically, what was the thing that you bring as a superpower from your actuary world into the world of coaching that helps you really strengthen leaders and, and lead these CEOs into the world in which they live. And uh, she, she gives some great answers there um, that I think are really great. She talks about this ABC model that she uses to coach clients, and you're going to get some good tidbits out of that as well. So without further ado, here we come. Daphna, so fun to have you, especially because your accent is different than mine. Yeah, great to be here. Definitely different accent, South African. Yes, yes. Um, one day I will, I will venture to the world of South Africa. I have lots of South African friends. So I figure I don't have to go there because I just have South African no, friends. It's the same it's thing. It's worth right? a visit. Beautiful yeah. country. Really worth a visit. I hear it's amazing. I hear it's amazing. In fact, you have... Um, you know, in that area of the world that you're in, it's different than my area of the world. You have hiked Kilimanjaro? I did. I did. I climbed Kilimanjaro. Yes. It was, was challenging. That? It was challenging. Whoa. It was really challenging. I say I'm not a naturally sporty person. Mm -hmm. So for me, that was part of the thing to take on a challenge. That's a physical challenge. It was hard every single day. And at the same time, it was really rewarding. It was beautiful, um, and I learned a lot about myself in the process. Hmm. What did you learn about yourself? Thanks for bridging that question for me. <laughs> well, since I wrote a book about it, and I always say the the book is my therapy for the whole uh, experience, uh, the book is called Courage to Lead, and it really takes us through the story of Kilimanjaro, but also what were the leadership lessons. And I didn't climb Kilimanjaro with the intention of writing a book afterwards, but it did just come out. And that is, I think, also because partly I needed to process some of the challenges and the things that, you know, I went through and I discovered about myself. So for sure, I discovered that I can do anything. It's one of those experiences that when you reach the top and it's been a really difficult experience on the way, that uh, you get this absolutely euphoric feeling of, wow, if I could do this, I can do anything. And I think just a couple of things, just maybe something around perspective, because when we were traveling before the climb, we were traveling to the hotel, we would stay there the night before we started the climb in the morning, we saw the mountain from the bus. And the bus driver stopped and we could all go out and look at this mountain and say, this is what we are going to be climbing tomorrow. And seeing it like that was just, okay, one view. It's kind of the view of when you don't know what you don't know. It's like, okay, cool. I'm going to do this hike. And then when we traveled back after the hike from the hotel back to the airport, stopped again at that very same vantage point 
and we saw the mountain again and it was a complete shift of perspective because now we had been on that mountain and we had climbed it and it took seven days to go up and down and that understanding of all of a sudden knowing what it took to actually climb the mountain changed my perspective completely it was a different feeling a different look at situations and I think we can really draw the analogy to what are the mountains that we face in our own lives that before we reach them, we think, okay, we can handle, we can handle almost anything. But after we've been through something and we've shifted in terms of our experience and our knowledge of what it takes, something in us changes as well. And I want to add one little bit, and that is that understanding there's a whole journey, you only really get to the top one step at a time. So if you just focus on the next step, so there's big goals, big mountain to, to climb, uh, but you can only focus on the next step in front of you and eventually you get there. So having faith in the small steps that get you towards a big goal. And those are some of the things that have stayed with me and that I've learned. I love that. I love that. Um, introduce us to you and why we should even listen to this episode, right? Like <laughs> tell us a little bit about you, Daphna. Where'd you come from? So where do I come from? I'm in Israel at the moment. That's where I live. I was actually born in Israel, but lived most of my life in South Africa, hence the accent. And I uh, came to live in Israel 10 years ago with my family. Um, I started off my career as an actuary, which is very numbers and statistics and risk, you know, assessment based and, you know, very mathematical and made this career transition to being uh, the CEO coach. I work with CEOs and executives to really up-level their leadership skills, to understand that leadership in order to lead your business and your people and yourself well, it starts with that inside-out journey, understand yourself so that you can lead people effectively to get the business results that you want. And for me, that transition was also a journey of following my heart and following my passion based on the some of the experience that I've had in working in corporates in, you know, in the field of uh, actuarial. So the big lessons there are that, and especially, you know, and it's evolved over time, but that you really do need to pay attention to who you are, know your center, know your core, take a stand and be a role model to your people and invest time in building those relationships and being a leader of people. And there's some skills that you can learn about that because I found that many of the people that I work with, the CEOs I work with, who come from a, an expert background, I suppose, like me, actuary can be lawyers, engineers, accountants, whatever coders, whatever your field of expertise is, that's what you were trained in. Um, there's another level of skill that you need when you get promoted to higher leadership levels. And that it's worth investing time, energy, and effort to learn those skills because that's going to upgrade your results to a completely different place. You can push and push and push but if and push people, but if you don't do it in a way that empowers and develops them, you're going to come up with a whole lot of challenges that people do. And then facing them is also something that you've got to learn how to do. So yeah, just invest the time in being the kind of leader that you want to be. Ask yourself, what kind of leader do I want to be? And how do I want to go on this journey of life or climbing the mountain so that I can also get satisfaction and fulfillment and success out of it? I'm so curious when I meet other coaches to hear about their background. Because I think that our backgrounds shape the way we coach. So tell me about that. Tell me about your, for example, my brand strategy world of where I come from. I use a lot of techniques I use to create corporate brand strategies and I use them to now develop leaders and teams in that space. You same exercises and some of the things I did in that space. And so what superpowers do you take from being an actuary that now you translate over into coaching CEOs? So that is a really good question because often... <laughs> When I'm running a workshop or speaking an event and people hear that I'm an actuary, they find it a little bit hard to believe. So to say, what skills have I taken from being an actuary? But jokes aside, um, I always say that the, the analytical skills that I learned from being an actuary and the ability to 
spot trends and work with the unknown. Because actually, if you just take a segue for a moment, what actuaries do is they try and make sense of an uncertain future in terms of the risks and the numbers associated with it so that we can create some models to price, whether it's insurance or investment products or whatever it might be. So what I say is, you know, when I'm coaching people, it's the same thing because our future is uncertain. We don't know what it's going to look like and people are unpredictable. So when you take those skills, analysis skills, problem solving skills, identifying trends and managing risks, those are things that I help people work with as a coach, but not in terms of the numbers of it and the building statistical models, but rather understanding people, understanding ourselves, understanding what it means to be a leader and what are the skills and tools I need in order to do this thing effectively. And those are not skills that we learn at university or college or where we came from. Those are skills that we develop on the job. And having that additional support and that additional element, practical element of what does it look like for me is invaluable. And I love that. I love that. So... Oh, I yeah. love it so much. I love hearing that stuff. That's so cool. That's so fascinating to me. What are the pain points right now hitting the CEO world? And yeah. when you're talking to your clients, you're coaching them through some things. What are they what what are they experiencing? What are you hearing? Yeah. So I'm hearing a lot of things like this, you know, the CEO has got a big vision, a way of thinking, something that they want to implement, and they feel there's a big gap between where they're at, the vision that they're holding, and where their team is at in terms of understanding them, listening to what they want to achieve, and following through, you know, holding, taking some accountability and being taking ownership for this vision that the CEO has in their mind that doesn't always connect and align to what's happening in the teams that have to be responsible for execution. So what the CEO will complain about is that everything's on their shoulders, that they are, are constantly putting out fires or chasing deliverables, constantly on the go. Um, they say things a lot of times and their team don't always listen. You know, that's an a common complaint. I've said this so many times. And then when I ask them what they think, they it's like they've never heard about it before. And then there's the whole thing of virtual teams, you know, people not always sitting in the same place, which is kind of the, the challenge that's been brought to us with this uh, age of technology, which I think has got wonderful elements to it as well. And I would also say that it's that, that, I call it the leadership gap. So where the CEO is sitting in terms of their own thinking, visioning, planning, strategic way of looking at things and where their team is, there's a bit of a gap. And that creates a lot of loneliness for them in their role as well. So, you know, they are the role model. They are the, pe the, the people that their people look up to. And at the same time, they need someone to support them, to coach them, to partner with them, to advise them. And, and that feels lonely because they can't really express everything that they're going through within their own organizational structures and not with their board as well. They can't often be completely honest and open. So there's a little bit of loneliness there for them as well. They say it's lonely at the top. Let's throw exactly. out the cliche. Just Let's throw like out the that. cliche. Um, so what's what's the dream? What are they wanting? Yeah. So it's interesting because I do have those discussions a lot with with my clients. And in fact, I had someone today and he said to me, the dream for me is that I feel that I've got people I can trust. So I can, he said to me, picture this, you know, that picture of the CEO sitting at their desk with a clean desk, the, the feet on the, you know, leaning back in their chair, the feet on the table and their hands behind their shoulders like this and just having a moment to enjoy the moment. And uh, that's kind of a bit of a pipe dream. It's how can I really build the team? And it's possible. This is what I want to say. It's so possible to have this dream. But I find that often the dream is how can I build a company, an organization, a business where I really can rely on my team and on my people to go forward without me so that I can take a vacation and not have to check in every single day on who's doing what or be accessible for questions all the time. It's something that's completely achievable. 
And uh, I think that's part of the dream. And I think the second part of the dream is really creating a business that is growing and thriving and contributing to society. Um, you know, the big visions in terms of what they want to achieve with their business as well. There is often, you know, the complaints that come, whether it is from teams or whether it is from leaders, um, finger pointing or excuses or these things are happening to me and I'm out of control and I don't feel in control and all these things. But when I, when I talk to people, there's generally a real problem behind the problem. And when you explore that with them, so we'll talk about, you know, this gap, there's a gap between where they are and where they want to be. And there's some stuff in the middle. Um, whether it's putting out fires, people aren't listening to them. Uh, they just feel alone. There's nobody that, like when we talk about the communication with the team of trying to drive change or bring people along and change, but people aren't coming. What do you find is like one of the core issues with that? So can I give you more than one core issue? There is one oh, yeah. core issue oh, yeah. and I'm going to go into more than one because this is where kind of my own model of leadership. I call it the ABC model of leadership. And I think it really highlights the, the core uh, areas of difficulty and areas where CEOs really do need to grow and, and leaders as well. And the first one, which is the A, I think is the starting point. So my A of the ABC of leadership is awareness. And that is self-awareness. It starts with that, that. I think. And, and in my model as well, We've got the practical level and the deeper level. And self-awareness sounds like this, you know, strange, what do I have to do, like a certain thing all day or actually not. It's actually being on a journey of personal development and growth within yourself. It's being, to ident being able to identify what are my strengths and what are my weaknesses? Where do I need to develop myself even more? And where do I need to understand that that's just not something that I'm good at? So perhaps hand over. So on a practical level, when you understand your strengths and weaknesses, when you understand what drives you, you know how to hire the right people to fill in those gaps. You know uh, what you're strong at and where you should be putting most of your focus and where to leverage your time. You need to understand how you're working. Is it effective? Is it productive? Those are the practical sides. The deeper side of that is having a level of realness with your people, being able to really talk about when I make mistakes, when I feel uncertain about the future, when I am worried about something, you know, being able to own some of those things yourself because then you're creating a culture of exactly that kind of behavior with others as well. So self-awareness is key and critical to running a good business with a healthy culture. Okay, so that's A. If we move on to B. <laughs> the B is all about bold moves. And this for me as well, the practical side of it is, as a CEO, I need to make decisions when I don't have all the information, when there are risks at play, and I, I need to make some some assessments, some guesses at what are the risks that you know the business can carry and what not. So practically, bold moves are required in your uh, leadership as a CEO and 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 decision making. I do say that a big part, I think. Most of the job of a CEO is to make decisions. It's one decision after another. And there's even a concept of decision fatigue. On a deeper level, what does bold moves mean? It means that you need to find the internal core of strength, courage, and resilience within you to really make those bold, bold moves, make those big decisions. And even when you don't know how it's going to land up, and there's a lot of uncertainty, which is the world that we're living in. So that's our B. And our C is communication. Again, I think if, if the one big thing that a CEO does all day long is make decisions, the second thing is communicate, right? And I think, yeah, practical level, clear, crisp, informative communication, lots of communication. I also say there's no such thing as too much communication because people do need things to be repeated so that they sink in. Uh, so that they get the messages across, so that they can really understand. You need to check. You need to have good communication, which also means listening. 
uh, confrontations, difficult conversations, all of those fall under communication. You know, where they need to pitch an idea, whatever it is, that's the practical side. The deeper side of that is creating connection because that's how you create deeper connections is with good communication skills. Then my C has got two more, which I'm going to quickly touch on. The second C is connection, connected relationships. And again, practically networking, we know that the people that we work with are the thing that drives our business and get to success. Um, deeper level is loyalty. How do you build loyalty with the different networks that we have? And the third C is about curiosity. Uh, and here yeah, it's really about innovation, gaining knowledge, learning. A leader's journey is a continuous journey of learning. You've got to be con continuously learning. You can't come to a place where you think, I have all the answers. I know exactly what I'm doing. I'm not going to hear from anyone else because then you are just narrowing your focus and you're putting a lid on your achievements. And the deeper level of that is the personal growth aspect, which brings us to self-awareness and uh, curiosity, curiosity about yourself and the people around you and wanting to understand how things work. So that's my ABC model of leadership. Beautiful. I often say it's uh, you know, from requote uh, Steve Cockrum. He's one of the founders of a, a company I'm associated with at Giant. But he he says you never graduate from the school of self awareness. It's this constant, like you just illustrated. It starts with self awareness, but that also leads us all the steps lead you back to self awareness, and and it's often the self awareness that leads us to this idea of oh, I know now where I need to self improve. Or I need to create some self-improvement, which makes me more self-aware. And then exactly. I just kind of keep building exactly. and building and building. So and it's a journey. It's a circle. It's a circle. It's not a process where you can, you know, check off the items that you've come. Okay, I've done the self-awareness thing. I've done the... No, yeah. it's a pro. You're yeah. always going back and deepening and learning and evolving. Yeah, I, I throw out the stats sometimes in my uh, one of my presentations that 95% uh, of people believe that they are self-aware. And the actual number is around 15 based on some studies and research wow. that was done. Wow. Um, and so, you know, there's a big unawareness gap in there That's also uh, true. That, that, that people are, are finding themselves in. So, yes, it is an ongoing journey and we will always be on it. Um, yeah. So it, it can be fun and it could be really empowering for us and others. Uh, if we're able yeah. to do that. And, and, and it requires a bit of work, right? It's, it, it is a bit oh, of yeah. work. Yeah. It requires, and not hard work, but it requires maybe focus and attention on it because you can ignore it and continue on your journey. But uh, if you do, you are going to hit some kind of a limit in terms of what you and your people and your business can achieve. What's unique about the the CEO's position and problems versus when you maybe work with team leads? Mm. I think it's really because CEOs feel that the, the back stops with them, right? Every The responsibility at the end of the day is on their shoulders. And that is whether it's towards their business and the teams underneath them or whether it's even at a higher level towards the board members or whatever, they're always answerable to people. And at the end of the day, they are the ones who carry the full responsibility of it. One of the CEOs that I worked with said to me, I am the only person in the business who doesn't sleep at night, you know, because the worries are on my shoulders. And it is a little bit like that. Team leads, and I think that, you know, every layer of the organization has its own unique uh, ch set of challenges and, and benefits. Uh, but middle management, if you look at that, also in this kind of sandwich place where they are answerable to their managers and they have to um, kind of navigate the messages that they're getting from their managers to their uh, people underneath them. However, we all know that the weight of responsibility, the success of the business, the results of the business land on the CEO's shoulders. They have to report to directors, shareholders, whoever it is, why things are not working, why they didn't meet targets, why things aren't moving as fast as they want, what's being held up. And, and that's a big burden to carry. Yeah. 
So what do they need to know right now? What do CEOs need to know right now in this age and this world that we're in leading the companies they're leading? I think for me, the most important thing is you don't need to go it alone. You don't need to have all the answers. You can say, I don't know, I need help. And actually in this world today, there is no such thing as knowing all the answers anyway. So not trying to pretend that you've got it all together. Ask for help when you need it. Reach out to the people that can help you. Mentors, advisors, coaches, your board, your shareholders. It's okay to say, I need help and then get the help that you need. And that could be professionally, it could be personally. You're managing a whole lot of things, juggling a whole lot of balls, needing to really make sure that everything is in its place. You don't need to do it alone. Know how to use your teams well, delegate, you know, all of those things and communicate what you need and get it done. Get the things that you need, get the support in place. You don't need to have all the answers and feel like you need to do it all alone. That is so true. And there's so many leaders out there that feel like they have to have all the answers because if they don't, then people look at them. They're afraid that people may look at them as incompetent or why are you in this role? If you don't have an answer for me, like you're the one who should have the answers. And, and those, I think the oughts and shoulds that they may feel from others expectations may put them in that state of fear or that state of, oh my gosh, I can't, I can't totally lower my wall of vulnerability because then people will see my weak spots and be afraid that I don't know what I'm doing. So then how that, you know, so, um, I can understand pieces of that, but I agree with you that in this day and age where we are now, especially with the younger generations, that that vulnerability is appreciated. It is so valued. You're not going to be able to convince anyone anyway that you have all, all the answers none of us do with the way the world is changing the level of uncertainty the level of unpredictability and and volatility we don't have the answers so don't try to pretend that you do and i think i do want to say just on that point there is a balance right it's really important to remember that it's not about you don't want to now go and be so vulnerable that if you are having a crisis of confidence, imposter syndrome, you're now going to be sharing it with your... Find the people that it's appropriate to share any part of your uh, vulnerability with and seek help from that person that is relevant. So whether it's something on a professional level, find a mentor who's going to help you professionally. If it's something on a more kind of stress-based level, find the professional who's going to help you to deal with that. You don't have to share everything with everyone. You've got to be selective about that. But mm -hmm. do reach out for help. And in terms of answers, I think if you bring uh, a certain question or a certain decision that needs to be made and, you know, about the way forward and you're not sure exactly how it should go, that you can definitely bring your team in, talk about it and uh, discuss together. You'll come up with things that you might not have thought of. So, yeah, just wanted to mention that as well. That is so good. So good. Um, use discretion in your community. Use discretion for use sure. Discretion. For sure. Use You're discretion. You're still a leader. You still have to show up as a leader. Find the places where you can get really vulnerable if you need to. Um, ask for help from the right channels. You have a lot of resources for leaders that mm -hmm. um, you have supplied. Not only are your books available, um, you have a mindset quiz yes. and some other thing. I, what were these um, leader cue cards yes. and things like that? Like, tell us about this stuff. Okay. So the mindset quiz, one of my favorite topics is talking about mindset, growth mindset or fixed mindset. I think people are often surprised what you were saying earlier about self-awareness. Uh, people often think they've got a growth mindset and they're very surprised to find out just how much of a fixed mindset can creep in there. So the mindset quiz is really about assessing, do you have a growth mindset or a fixed mindset and in which areas, in which situations? So it's really worth taking a look at that and, uh, you know, seeing, learning a little bit about yourself in terms of that. The leadership cue cards, I call them the coach in the box. It's open-ended questions that enable you to take a challenge or an issue that you're dealing with and kind of self-coach, go through the questions and ask them to yourself, write, write down the answers so that you can brainstorm and come up with different perspectives. And you know, it's, it's great to work within a team as well. 
And then there's the leadership toolkit, which is also just a whole lot of tools that you can use to shed light on some of the areas that might be challenging for you and hopefully provide you with some uh, tips and ideas to work with them. Powerful. Thank you for providing so much help so to the pleasure. world. I mean, mm. it's great. Um, I love it. I love where being do people... part of the solution. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, where do people get in touch with you? How do uh, people connect with you? Um, where do they get hold of your books, etc.? Yeah, books are on Amazon. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm actually on LinkedIn, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. Those are my main channels. Easy to find me if you Google my name. I've got a website. Very easy to find me. Reach out, ask your questions. Always happy to connect. Awesome. Well, it's been beautiful talking to you. Um, Thank you, Scott. Like-minded people are my favorite. I, I love like that we can connect on some level in some way. And thanks for doing what you do. So uh, keep doing it. Thank you to you too. A, B, C. Awareness, bold moves, communication. Awareness about who we are. Awareness about what makes us tick. Awareness about how we're affecting others in our communication style. It is so important for us to be aware. Uh, like I said in my interview, 95% of people believe they're self-aware. 15% of them actually are. That's a huge gap. And I want us to start with that and, and understand that it is an ever-evolving process. We are never, you know, as Steve Cockrum says, we are we never graduate from the school of self-awareness. It is something we are always, always going to be doing. Um, taking bold moves, making taking risks, those things that bring reward, not not haphazard, kind of crazy, you know, destructive risks. We're talking about calculated risks. And I think that that's where her actuary world kind of add some value to what she's doing with her coaching clients. And then communication, clear, crisp, connecting with people, adding the element of curiosity in how you communicate, being open to being curious and others being curious, asking questions. There's a lot of things that we can do in that communication space that I think is going to be really, really important for us. Um, what is the dream? The dream is having people you can trust. You can only do your job so well. Other people have to do their job as well. If, if you cannot trust them, there's going to be some problems. Um, there's going to be tr problems with how we connect, our stress levels, the way we can perform. We have to be healthy ourselves, uh, but we also have to help others be healthy uh, in order to do their jobs that they need to do as well. So please go check out all Daphne's free stuff on our website. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff there. Um, we didn't necessarily hit on her uh, podcast called Leadership Live with Daphne Horowitz, but you can go check that out as well. She's got, again, those free resources. So um, I hope you will find some goods there. And until next time. If you want to find out more information about me or check out the show notes where there's going to be more information and links to the things referenced in this episode, visit scottwaldron.com. And lastly, I'm asking for a little bit of love, just a little bit. So please take a moment, follow, rate the show. The algorithms like that. It helps me get the word out. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And until next time, stay unlocked.